Hi everybody. Um, tonight I'd firstly like to start by wishing you all a very happy Badger Week and it's great to have such a wealth of Badger events across the country and tonight we're in for a real treat with two very special guests talking. Um, first up will be Claire Toner who's going um, to give us a chat about the Badgers down at Baldo Clyde. Um, she is a Clyde Valley Ranger and she's based at Baldo Clyde and um, I worked down there with her. She's worked for about five years with the Trust and um, has been based there for about two years. Most of her time's um, spent on the Clyde Valley Reserves and uh, doing badger watches and things like that. So it's an ideal opportunity for her to find out what the resident badgers have been up to. Um, then we'll have a wee five, ten minutes, some questions and answers. And then we'll go on to our second speaker, who's going to be uh, Michael McCaskill. Um, he's a researcher from the University of Glasgow, and he's going to be sharing his novel master's degree research, um, which is about badger nests. Uh, I can't wait for you to hear all about his groundbreaking study, actually. It's amazing stuff. Um, and then again, we'll have some time for question and answer. So over to Claire, if you'd like to start. I will mute myself. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my presentation should be coming up soon. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. My name's Claire Toner. Um, I'm Clyde Valley Ranger. Um, so I look after, help to look after five reserves um, in the Clyde Valley area. I uh, spend most of my time at Falls of Clyde. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, a little bit, give you some background about Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Falls of Clyde Reserve. And then we'll be watching some trail camera footage of the badgers that live at the Falls of Clyde and um, sort of investigating a bit more into their behaviours. Okay. Thanks, Rory. If you just go on to the next one. Um, so Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, we're Scotland's leading conservation charity and we've been protecting Scotland's habitats and species for 55 years now. We have um, 20, 120 wildlife reserves that cover over 20,000 hectares and we're extremely uh, lucky to have uh, over 40,000 supportive members who support us and help make a positive difference to Scot Scotland's wildlife. Um, there are more than 20 active member centres uh, throughout Scotland and these are local groups which are involved in different sort of events, uh, conservation projects, um, fundraising and they might all organise walks and talks as well um, which you can join. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so we have a vision. Um, so our vision for the Scottish Wildlife Trust is to have a connected network of healthy, resilient ecosystems supporting Scotland's wildlife and people. But why do we need this vision? Well, um, in recent years, there's been many great conservation successes, um, but wildlife, unfortunately, is still in decline. So we need to um, up our game really in the scale and scope of our conservation efforts um, because we're still trying to fight against rapid environmental and climatic change. So next one. Um, so how will we achieve our vision? Um, we'll champion the ecological, moral, social and economic reasons to protect and restore nature. We'll demonstrate best practice in practical conservation on our reserves. And we'll ins inspire people to experience, learn and care for wildlife um, and wild places through things like our events and educational activities. So where are our reserves? Um, like I said before, there's over 120 spread out through throughout Scotland, but here's uh, a few in more detail. So if you look at the top left, you can see where Hander Island is off the no northwest coast of Scotland. It's a real haven for seabirds um, and you're able to go over there for a, a day trip visit uh, by taking the passenger ferry from the mainland. Um, and then if 
if we go to Rahoy Hills, um, they, this is situated on the Morven Peninsula. It's just the land adjacent to the Isle of Mull. Um, it's quite isolated and it has beautiful hills and woodlands and some of the wildlife you can see there are golden eagles, sea eagles and red deer. And then moving southwards in Scotland, we've got the red moss of Belerno, which is on the edge of the Pentland Hills. So it's the only raised bog in the city of Edinburgh. And um, the deep peat layer has accumulated for thousands of years. So it's really important rare habitat. And then we have Cumbernauld Glen, which is um, in the central belt in within a very urban area, but it's amazing area of ancient woodland and a really important green space for the area. So the next one, please. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the reserves um, closer to me in the Clyde Valley. Um, so you can see Falls of Clyde at the bottom right of the map. Um, and this is where I spend about 90% of my time because we get a lot of visitors there. Um, and it's part of the Clyde Valley National Nature Reserve. So you'll, you'll see um, the other areas that are coloured in kind of lilac-y purple, they are reserves that are also part of the Clyde Valley Woodlands National Nature Reserve. Um, there's over 40 uh, NNRs in Scotland and they cover um, more than 95 hectares. They're internationally important sites and they're managed by um, approved body bodies for nature conservation and people. Um, so the Clyde Val Valley NNR was formed in 2007 and the other um, reserves that are part of it are Shatleroe, you can see that at the top, um, and Maudley Woods, and they're managed by South Lanarkshire Council. And then we have Carlton Crags and Cleghorn Glen, which are just a bit further north of Falls of Clyde, and they're managed by uh, Nature Scott SNH. Um, and you'll see two other dots on the map as well, two black dots. We've got Upper Nethan Gorge and Gary and Gill and um, they are reserves that I also help look after. And there's a reserve that doesn't appear on this map, which is Candamos. Um, it's not publicly accessible, which is why it doesn't uh, appear, but it's a, a, a raised bog as well. And um, that has rare um, moss plants and invertebrates. The next one, please. Um, so why is the Clyde Valley so special? Um, so during the last ice age, this area would have been covered in ice. And as the glaciers melted, uh, the meltwater that was released uh, eroded a deep channel um, in the soft red sandstone and it created a really steep sided gorge. So you can see in the picture there how steep those cliffs are. This is at Falls of Clyde. Um, so some cliffs that we have on the reserve are over 50 meters high. Um, and the River Clyde still flows through this gorge today. Um, over time, woodlands became established in the area, and it's these outstanding tracts of ancient semi-natural woodlands uh, that would have covered most of lowland Scotland. And they've survived for hundreds of years, relatively undisturbed, just because the steep gorges wouldn't allow uh, for people to come along and harvest the timber. So initially, any wildlife living there has been protected by its inaccessibility, but more re recently it's been afforded legal protection um, as the reserves, reserve is a site, site of special scientific interest um, and it's designated because of its geological features and woodland. Um, so if we have a look at the map of the Falls of Clyde, um, we get over 60,000 visitors from all around the world each year. And it's been a famous destination for tourists for over 250 years. Um, it was really popular with Victorians when they were doing um, their tours of Europe uh, to come and marvel at the, the nature there. So if we look down at the bottom of the map, you can see the visitor center. Um, and this is where we have our offices as well. Um, and the Wildlife, Scottish Wildlife Trust has been managing the Falls of Clyde since 1967. So I think it was one of the first reserves that we had. Um, so in the visitor centre, there's also a small shop and an exhibition room where we can um, have our public events and educational activities. Um, the reserve's really popular for people to come and visit, to go and walk. There is a 
footpath that goes directly next to the river and there's a boardwalk where you can look out for all sorts of river wildlife like dippers, otters, herons, uh, wagtails and then you'll go past the hydroelectric power station which was one of the first in Scotland up to Bonington Pavilion which is otherwise known as the Hall of Mirrors which is another old historical structure and then um, there are three waterfalls on the reserve which most people come to see. So this is one of the most famous waterfalls, um, it's Coralin. It's the highest one on the reserve. Uh, the drop is over 27 metres. Um, and like I said before, it started forming during the last ice age. It's Britain's largest waterfall by volume. And uh, so not by height, but by how much water goes over it. So in full spates, there can be 560 tonnes of water per second going over this waterfall. Um, it has been viewed by many artists and painted by Turner, Naismith and more, and written about by uh, Dorothy Wordsworth. There can be a great variation of water, water flow throughout the season. So in the summer, it might be a gentle trickle, but in winter, it looks a bit more like this. We've had a bit of background about Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Falls of Clyde Wildlife Reserve, where the badgers make their home. Um, but now we're going to go into a bit more depth about badgers and have a look at their behaviour. Uh, so badgers are really active on the, on the reserve. And some of you might have come to our badger watches, which we're hoping to start in summer this year. Um, badgers are active, active throughout the year, but they're a bit less active in the colder winter months, so they won't come and forage above ground quite as often. They're primarily nocturnal and they take advantage of the quieter night times to forage. They have very small eyes, but their eyesight is specially adapted to the low levels of light in twilight. Um, they have this characteristic black and white stripy face, which is easy to spot in low light levels. So you can see them when you come to the Badger Watches. Um, but it's thought that this stripy face is a warning um, to other animals that they have a nasty bite, much in the same way that a wasp is striped uh, yellow and black to show that it has a sting. Um, they're prolific diggers and they have really sharp claws to dig through the earth for, to dig their sets, but also to find food. Um, they're a member of the mustelid family, so they're in this family with otters, pine martins, stoats and weasels. And characteristics of the mustelid family are that they have um, scent glands, um, which produce quite a pungent scent. And they also have short limbs and quite long bodies, so they have this characteristic kind of undulating movement. Um, so next we're going to have a look at why badgers live at Falls of Clyde. So if we have a look at um, the landscape in Falls of Clyde, you can see that there is woodland growing alongside the edges of the River Gorge. And um, the, the edges of the gorge are very steep and some of them are like almost sheer drops. So there's a good mixed species woodland for them to... Um, dig their sets and also the soil is a sandy clay mix so it's well draining. Um, you can see here this is another view so we have the meadow in the foreground which is a good place for foraging um, and then there's a strip of woodland and then there's farmland so there's pastures beyond uh, which is also a good place to forage uh, because the ground's quite easy to dig up. Um, so in 2019, um, we conducted an extensive survey um, to collect some data for Michael's Masters, which he'll talk about later. Um, and from this survey, we managed to locate 11 main sets um, within the reserve, but also in the boundary. So potentially, this could mean there are 11 clans, so 11 families of badgers that live on or might use the reserve for foraging. Um, so I did a bit of a sort of um, estimation calculation. So don't take this as uh, being fact, because um, this is just based on rough numbers. Um, 
so the, the average badger density in the UK is 1.39 badgers per kilometre squared. Um, so if you take an average clan size of five with the breeding pair, two cubs from that year and a yearling from last year, though clan sizes can vary, um, we would have an estimated badger density at Falls of Clyde of 112 badgers per kilometre squared based on the area of the reserve. So this is 80 times the UK average. What we do need to remember are, you know, it is just an estimate and much of UK land is completely uninhabitable for badgers because it might be covered in concrete or houses or that sort of thing. But still we have an amazing concentration of badgers there. Um, so you might wonder why. Well, like I said before, the habitat is really good. So they have um, the cover from the woodlands and also the sloped grounds, which they like to use to dig uh, their sets in. And they have amazing grounds for foraging. So they'll forage within the reserve and also um, in the boundaries as well. Um, so with all these badges on the reserve, we've had an amazing opportunities to observe them. Um, the Scottish Wildlife Trust have been running badger watches at Falls of Clyde for over 30 years. Um, we hope to, we hope, really, really hope we can start them up again this summer because I've been missing them myself. Um, but in the meantime, we've still been able to keep an eye on our badges with the use of trail cameras. So we're going to show you some footage collected on the reserve and um, we'll explain a bit about the behaviour that you see. And hopefully this, this will give you some idea of their lives as social and complex animals. So this is our first video. <laughs> and um, you, what you're going to see now is the clan. So this is the family of badgers, um, one of the families of badgers that live at Falls of Clyde. And you'll see the mother and three cubs. So have you played the video just now? So would you be able to play that again, Rory? And I'll just talk a little bit, bit about, um, about it as it plays. So we've got three cubs here in this clan, but they can have up to five in a litter. Um, there's just one breeding pair per clan and the females can mate um, in springtime as soon as the cubs have been born because she can do something called delayed implantation. So even though the embryo is fertilised, she won't become pregnant. It won't be implanted until winter time. Um, so if she's in good condition for the winter, basically, um, she has enough uh, weight on her, then she can become pregnant and then have she'll have her cubs underground in the set in February. And the cubs will make their first steps in April above ground. So this video was captured at the beginning of April. So this is probably one of their first journeys above ground uh, with their mother. So this next one was taken in 2019 and um, this is in the same location and um, so the same family group though um, breeding adults might change over time and um, so what I want you to do is try and count the number of badges in this video. Can you, oh, can you play that one more time? Because it's quite quick. So I hope you all got the same number as I did. Um, so I saw there was a breeding pair and there was some young of the year, which I think was <laughs> three three cubs and then we have two young from last year as well so that should be seven if I can do maths <laughs> okay so this next video is um 
we'll see the badgers digging out their set so they need to find somewhere to live um, and so they dig a set underground with a number of sleeping chambers and they'll dig into slope ground in well draining soils um, they like some cover so maybe some woodland or some vegetation like gorse uh, to give them a bit of extra protection the underground tunnels can be vast they can go on for um, 500 meters up to a kilometer and there'll be nesting chambers there, a series of them that are just bigger than a badger size because they like to sleep there on their own. Um, do you just play the clip just now? Um, so what I, we play the clip again and uh, what I'd like you to look at is the kind of comedy digging that they do because they don't seem to put the earth back um, to either side of their body alternating the legs either side of their body they sort of push it through with both legs at the same time underneath their body and they kind of have to jump out of the way um, so it seems to be quite effective uh, but it just looks quite amusing um, and you might be able to notice where that badger's standing is a big mound of earth so this is all the excavated earth which is known as the spoil heap and if the ground's particularly rocky they'll just dig out the rocks as well so we found um, some spoil heaps which have lots of stones and and rocks in them so they really are um, absolutely amazing diggers so um if you're wondering why they're such good diggers, you only need to look at their feet. So um, this is a footprint of the badger in some muddy ground and you can see it has five toes. So um, they have five toes on each of their front and back feet. Um, and they also have five claws at the end of their toes. And you can see the indentations of the claws there just in the footprint. Um, so these are really strong claws. They're not retractable like a cat's. Uh, they stay out all the time, um, but they're really, really strong. So if we just go on to the next video, uh, I want you to have a look at the badger's feet and you might be able to see the claws sticking out at the front. So when, when the video plays, if you just have a look at um, the, the feet of the badgers and you'll see, you might see claws on both their front and back feet, uh, but the front feet have longer and thicker, thicker claws because these are the ones that we used for digging. And if, if that's not working, we can just skip on to the next one, it's fine. Okay, so um, they've dug their set with their bedding chambers, but they need to make them more comfortable. So they collect bedding from the woodland floor. So they'll collect um, dead leaves and moss and grass. Um, but sometimes they also might collect live plants. And um, there's been records of them collecting things like dogs, mercury or bluebells. Um, and it's thought that these might have some insecticidal properties. If you just play the video and we can watch it collect its bedding. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with a couple of the videos, Claire. Okay. Uh, we can try the next one. This is a, another bedding collection video as well. So you will have seen uh, the badger collecting the bedding and going backwards and again, it's got that funny sort of um, technique where it pulls everything towards its body with its two front legs and kind of hops backwards. Um, another thing that they like to do with the bedding is um, they might take it out uh, to air it on the spoil heap. Um, and they, they do this um, when there's a lot of parasites. Um, 
building up underground. So they do have this kind of ungainly motion, but it seems to work quite well for them. We we'll just go on to the next one. So we're going to have a look at badgers foraging. So this is them collecting their food. Um, you can see just by the still that it has its face in the ground. Um, so they rely really heavily on their scent, on their sense of smell. Their sense of smell is amazing, absolutely amazing, thought to be 800 times better than our own. So they probably have this scent picture of their environment around them, um, which we can't even comprehend. And they'll use their strong claws to dig under the ground and then they'll snuffle about for different things like roots and tubers. Um, a favourite root is pignut. Um, they eat a lot of invertebrates as well, but they might also scavenge on carrion. Um, the di diet might vary seasonally, so in the autumn it might have um, some nuts and seeds. Um, they're really good disperser of plant seeds, actually, so it'll come out in the dung when they go to the toilet. Um, so the diet will vary, vary temporarily and also spatially, well, lat latitudinally, so where they live in Europe. Um, but we find in northern hemispheres, most of their diet is earthworms. It makes up um, over half of their diet. So we'll just have a look at this clip of foraging. So you can see it's really digging in there, <laughs> just tearing up the ground and putting its face right in. And it, and if you watch them when they are foraging, sometimes when they lift their heads up, you can see their nose is full of soil. Um, the next video is another foraging one, um, but I'd like you to turn your sound up um, because you can actually hear it when, it when it finds something, you can hear these munching noises. And you'll also see in the background, there's another member of its clan, which is digging the set out at the same time. Brilliant. Um, is, again, on the foraging theme, this next clip is um, of mother, mother and cub foraging. But what I would like you to notice on this one is the difference in their behaviour, um, because this cub is one of the young from this year. So it's only a few months old um, and it will still be suckling. If it'll start to get weaned. Um, soon, but they can still suckle right into summertime. So you can see the difference in, in sort of how committed they are to this foraging activity. So I hope you noticed that, uh, you know, the mum's digging, she's putting her face into the ground, uh, but the cub is just kind of faffing about, really. It's, co it's copying what she's doing. It's not really putting its snout very well into the ground. It's pushing things along, um, but it's, it's only learning, so um, it'll get there in time. Uh, the next one is the same group, so the same clan, the mother and cubs, um, and she's foraging and they're fo following about and having a little play around. Um, but what I want you to have a look at, uh, well, listen as well, because you'll hear some vocalisations. And also, if you look at the bottom left of your screen, you'll see something interesting kind of happening. So did you notice that there's two things happening there? There was another adult coming in, which it looks like the mother gave a little warning nip to, as in what are you doing? Don't get too close. Um, but there's also a fourth cub, <laughs> which we didn't find out about until we saw this clip. So that's quite exciting um, to see that their, their litter is, is one larger than we had anticipated. 
Uh, the next few clips I'm going to we're going to show are um, of a behaviour that if you've ever watched badges, you've probably seen them doing, and um, it's grooming. So I'll, if you just play this clip, and then we can have a little chat about it. So um, grooming behaviour is usually one of the first behaviours that they exhibit when they come out of the set for an evening time when they emerge. Um, they groom a lot of the time. They'll also do it in the middle of foraging. They'll just sit down and have a little scratch as well. Um, they can carry quite a lot of ectoparasites, so parasites on the outside of their bodies, uh, like fleas, lice and ticks. They might not have all three of them, but they'll at least have one. So they must get really quite itchy and then staying underground in the warm conditions with the bedding. They, they'll be crawling all over them down there as well. So no wonder when they come out for the night, they want to have a good scratch. If we just go on to the next one. So you see from the, the video before in this one, they concentrate on their bellies, their legs and their tail. Um, and But there are, are some harder to reach bits on their bodies, like the back of their neck and their back. Um, so they uh, groom each other. And this is known as aloe grooming. And you can see this in the next clip. So you can see there, they were nibbling away. They use their front teeth, their incisors um, to nibble away at each other's necks and backs. Um, there's one badger a youngster that obviously isn't uh, really taking it seriously and just having to jump around instead. Um, the next behaviour we're going to have a look at is scent marking. So I mentioned earlier that they're a member of the mustelid family. So they have these scent glands um, uh, near the base of their tail and um, you'll see them exhibiting some different sort of scent marking behaviours. Um, they can deposit scent when they sit down on the ground, but they also scent mark each other. Um, and the scent that they produce might relate to their individual identity. It might give the others clues about um, their sex, their age, their body condition and their reproductive status. Um, it can be used to mark territory boundaries and when they mark each other, it's to reinforce social bonds. And we have one sniffing the camera quite excitedly there. Um, so if you go out when it's snowing, where badgers are, you might see their scent deposits. Um, it's this bright orange mark, and that's um, the secretions that they leave behind. And this is some more interesting scent marking behavior. Um, so this is the clan that we've seen this year. Um, and I want you to watch what happens with them. You'll see them sort of like top left of your screen.
So you can see that they were um, sent marking on each other. The adults were sort of squatting down on the cubs, but um, the cubs also exhibit this behaviour called scent theft. So they'll walk underneath the badger, underneath the adults, um, to get the scent on top of them. And this is this is something that the cubs do themselves rather than the adults doing it. So this helps to distribute the communal scent and reinforce the social bonds in their uh, clan. Uh, so we've talked a bit about scent marking. Uh, we're going to watch some badgers playing around now. And the reason that I played this clip is because you see badgers running, which you don't often see them do. Um, they usually walk around quite slowly or they can trot about maybe about seven miles an hour and they can sustain that for quite a long time. But their top speeds are between 25 and 30 miles an hour, which you wouldn't expect really from an animal that looks so slow. Um, so they could un un outrun humans if we were going up hills, um, but they can't really sustain this speed for very long it's just a kind of short burst to escape uh, predators uh, the next clip is also um some playing behavior uh, but this involves more individuals and um, so just showing that play is not just reserved for young but um, adults can get involved as well And the next clip we'll see is um, of uh, two youngsters play fighting. Um, so they're learning how to play. Uh, they're learning how to fight through play, but hopefully not getting hurt themselves. So you can see them there twisting and turning. They have really strong neck muscles. So um, they can try and escape uh, the bites on the necks without getting hurt, without getting the neck broken. And they might need to fight uh, to defend territories or to fight for mates. Um, you know, they might need to defend their clan against rogue males as well. So it was quite, quite an extensive bit of fighting. Um, this is the last bit of footage I'm going to show you of um, badgers at Falls of Clyde. Um, and what you see is badger in maybe quite an unusual place. It's above the ground and it looks like it's made a nest. You can see bedding there uh, at the crook of the uh, tree uh, trunks. Um, so it, and it's out in the daytime, which might seem a bit strange. Um, but Michael will 
um, explain more about this in his talk, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, and you can see this male budget who's grooming himself with great concentration. So enjoy this one. You can see he's having a really good scratch of his belly and uh, chewing on his legs there as well. Um, so we've concentrated on badges at Falls of Clyde, but our trail cameras are out and they'll just record whatever happens to be around. So here's a short compilation of some other things that we've captured on the trail cameras. So you can see there's a jay there, just bottom right of your screen. Um, you usually hear them squawk first. Uh, there's a male blackbird, and there's lovely shiny black plumage, and there's really bright yellow um, eye ring and beak, and they're ground feeders. Um, so if you do feed birds, it's, it's quite important to put out some food on the ground as well for, for black, um, ground feeders like blackbirds. And um, they like invertebrates, uh, so if you have any male worms, they'll like them. And here's a male great spotted woodpecker. You can tell he's male because he has a red patch at the back of his head. And he's um, looking under moss and bark on this mature tree for invertebrates. Oh, and you will have seen uh, <laughs> there is a fledgling robin just on the tree trunk there. And its parent has flown off. So we need to see if we can go and get, get to it. And he does, yay, he gets there, and then the adult flies away. And here we go, it's a very, very fast mouse. Blink and you'll miss it. And here we have a hare, they're much larger than rabbits. They have huge ears, a really powerful legs for running very quickly. And an adult fox, we see them quite regularly around the badger sets, but they don't seem to cause each other any bother, the badgers and the foxes. And then we have a roe deer adult. So it's out at night, um, enjoying the quiet of the night uh, as an opportunity for foraging. And we have a male, so a book roe deer, you can see his antlers there. And he's not bothered at all by what's going on in the background. You can hear some kind of construction work going on, but they, they get used to it and um, these sorts of noises on the reserve. And then next we have uh, the roe deer rut. So you'll see the female coming past first, being hotly pursued by the book. And um, so he's chasing around to check if she is uh, ready for mating. So you can hear the snorting noises. He's trying to sniff her pheromones. And she's giving him a good for, run for her money because she wants to test the strength basically and see if he is fast enough and strong enough um, to be the father of her, her fawns. And there we go, we've got two fawns and they have this dappled uh, coat, so white spots to help them camouflage when they're really young. And the mother will leave them when she goes foraging when they're this age. So if you do find deer uh, that are young, lying in the woods, just leave them because it's probably their mum will come back for them later. Obviously, if they're injured, you know, you get in touch with um, the SSPCA. But we've seen these regularly and we've seen them grow up in subsequent trail, trail camera footage. So that's that's a really nice thing to, to be able to observe. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, this has just been re a real snapshot of the sorts of things that badgers get up to at Falls of Clyde and the other wildlife that we might see as well. Um, so if you want to support Scot Scottish wildlife, uh, please join Scottish Wildlife Trust, you can find details on our website and you can also find details of our events that um, will be coming up in the summer. Thanks, Claire. That was interesting. Um, do you know I could watch their playful antics all night? It's amazing. Um, there's a few wee minutes left before we go on to Michael and what I'll do is I'll just pick out the top few wee questions there. So, 
We've got, on average, how far will a badger travel at night to forage? Okay, I guess it depends really um, on what's around it. So if it was in um, an unpopulated area with not many badgers, they might travel really far. So they might travel um, a few kilometres, um, but at Falls of Clyde, they probably won't go that far at all uh, because the foraging ground are right outside their sets. So they'll be quite close to where they live to forage. Okay. Um, do you think lockdown and with uh, Falls of Clyde not being as populated by people, would you expect this to affect badger clans in any way? Um, so during lockdown, there's still quite a lot of people come into Falls of Clyde um, because the, the local people were using it for their walks. Um, and ordinarily, you know, we would have a lot of visitors anyway. So I think the badgers at Falls of Clyde are quite used to people wandering around the paths. Um, you know, bag badgers are a protected species, so we, we don't spend any time near where they live in their sets. Um, but they'll be used to people and dog walkers and horses wandering around on the path to Falls of Clyde. Um, so I, I think they're just, you know, they're, they're pretty well um, used to noises and things going on. Yeah. Um, okay, just a couple of wee quick ones. Uh, how long have you been monitoring the badgers for? Um, so I know that Scottish Wildlife Trust have been doing the badger watches for over 30 years. So I would say over 30 years then, because um, when we do badger watches, we also collect data when we're there. You know, how many badgers we see, um, what time they come out, the sort of behaviours that they they're doing if they're doing anything unusual that we might need to investigate further and um, so as long as that which is way before my time yeah. um and just lastly really quickly um i set up a trail camera this lady said and she's found a fox sharing the set why would this be um well we've you know we see sort of foxes and badgers going around in the same habitat um they're both strong animals with big teeth. You know, if they did want to fight, if they did have a fight, somebody would be very, very injured. So it's just not worth it for them to have any conflict. Um, they can share set entrances, but they won't sleep in the same chambers. So they'll have, um, the badgers will be in their set and the fox will be in its den, but they might share the same entrance hole. So the fox will have different tunnels and different places to sleep. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Um, and that's over to you then, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay, for the introduction and a great presentation, Claire. That was great to see all the videos. Um, so I'll just wait for Rodi to get my slides up. Perfect. Um, so thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, do a presentation tonight on some badger research at Falls of Clyde um, and this was a uh, research that I carried out um, for my master's um, degree. I'm actually just going to switch off my video just because I don't have the strongest internet connection uh, just so I can uh, keep speaking clearly, with, clearly without lagging. Uh, so we've got to uh, move on to the next slide please Rory. So first thing I wanted to do uh, was just to provide a bit of background on the research that I was presenting this evening. Um, I completed my Master's of Research in Ecology and Environmental Biology at the University of Glasgow, and that was in the academic year of 2019 to 2020. And the research I'm uh, going to talk through this evening was carried out to fulfil the main research component of the course, um, which was a 12-month independent project um, uh, researching a, a topic of ecology. And having studied badgers um, previously at undergrad level, I was continued to do so uh, again at Masters. And at the beginning of the year, I was lucky enough to be introduced to Elaine and Leslie from Scottish Badgers Charity through Clare um, at uh, Falls of Clyde and Scottish Wildlife Trust. And from here, I was invited to meet at the visitor centre on the reserve, and we discussed the prospect of studying above ground badger nests. So my presentation today will go through the work involved in the project and um, the results I found, and I'll put a bit of focus on to how we carried this out at Falls of Clyde. Uh, so just the next slide there. Perfect. Thank you. So 
first off, what are above ground nests? Um, well, as the name suggests, they are a nest that a badger is about above ground, rather within their sets. Um, and however, they can be described as, as other names in literature and, and in books, and, and these include couch and day nest. Um, they have a common structure of, of bedding arranged in a donut shape, and you can see that just in the, the top picture there. But this occurs in varying extents, um, but it's similar to the arrangement of bedding that you do find inside the set as well. And you can use a number of common field signs to identify these nests, and that includes the bedding itself, um, badger prints or hairs, and even dung pits uh, close by. So just the next slide, please. So the first step of the research was to find out what was known so far um, about nests and, and from not and, and, and from learning about them, I, I, I was keen to learn more. So I began to dig through research and to build up a, a greater understanding of things like, uh, or to try and build up a greater understanding of things like the reasons for their use, their function, and, and where to find them as well. And I was surprised to find that anecdotal reports of badgers using nests in, in the UK went back as early as 1914. And some of these reports are uh, very interesting, such as Timothy Roper stumbling across badgers sleeping in the middle of a field during the day, or Ernest Neal finding very young cubs um, in a nest made of straw within a barn. And that can be seen just in this, uh, just about be seen in the picture, a plate from his uh, book Badgers. Um, and despite considering nests very rare, Ernest Neal also tried to cat or attempted to categorize nests into three types. And these were uh, as follows. So first up was breeding nests. And that was a nest for the raising of young when set conditions were unsuitable. Um, summer nests was next. And that was nests far from sets, but close to foraging grounds um, as a kind of stop off. And lastly, set nests. And that was nests that occurred close to or around the entrances of sets. Um, and which badgers would use to socialise and groom before they went back in in the morning or came out at night. But despite these anecdotal, uh, anecdotal records going way back, I was surprised to find that peer-reviewed research was much more limited. And the um, scientific papers available focused on areas across the badger's full range, such as montane environments in Poland, where traditional set construction was not possible, or southwest Portugal, where conditions, um, weather conditions were too hot to sleep underground. And lastly, the research always focused on nest use as a daytime resting place, so where badgers slept during the day. And this didn't take into consideration the other uh, possible uses that Ernest Neal had, had identified when he classified his nests. Uh, just the next slide there, please. So to me, there appeared to be um, gaps existing in the previous knowledge. And firstly, uh, the traditional view on nests suggested that although rare, they possibly had multiple functions. And this was based on first-hand observations and anecdotal reports. And secondly, the research carried out was focused on very specific conditions and use, and it didn't explore this, and the research didn't explore this. There also seemed to be a general lack of awareness uh, surrounding nests, with very limited mention and survey and best practice guidance, despite from how I understood it from what I had read, that they perhaps went as far as almost fitting the description of a set in the uh, Protection of Badgers Act. And this, um, as, as, as you can see here, any structure or place which displays signs indicating current use by a badger, which um, nests did when badgers uses them. So it appeared that if there was a chance that nests did um, support important behaviours or life stages, then it may be worthy of similar protection as sets. And that, of course, wouldn't be possible without a greater awareness or understanding. And just the next slide, thank you. So from this and based on observations Leslie had made already through her uh, monitoring, I set out the following research questions to try and fill some of the gaps that I'd found. And first off, I wanted to look at where badger nests were found within a badger territory in relation to other features in their um, territory, such as habitats, uh, habitat boundaries, territory boundaries, and different set types. Um, 
And for this, I included both latrines and habitat boundaries as key features and indicators of badger territories. And I'll go into a wee bit why I've done that um, next. Uh, and the second aim I was looking at was to see when badgers were using them in terms of times of day and time of year, and to look at the diff to explain names such as day nest or, or to shed more um, light on, on how and why they were being used. And lastly, I wanted to bring it together uh, to look to see um, if the function of the nest and how it was being used was related to where it was found within the territory. And just next slide, thank you. So I just wanted to do a wee short aside as to how I, I define territory boundaries within the study. And due to the programme of the, the project, it wasn't possible to carry out bait marking surveys to fully map territory extents. So to give an indication of this, I included both latrines and habitat boundaries as key features and indicators of badger territories. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, badgers are known to territorially mark um, their territories using latrine pits and dung. But studies also show that badger territorial edges are often significantly associated with linear or habitat edge features, such as woodland edges, hedgerows, and other natural or, or human influenced um, boundaries, such as stone walls or gates. And previous studies show that this relationship is particularly significant with up to 95% of latrines found within five meters of a boundary feature of some type or another. Uh, next slide, thank you. So to answer the, the questions that I'd set out as uh, for my research required um, a multi-part methodology. So I had a couple of different um, processes we had to go through. And the first up was the nest monitoring. When I began the project, Leslie had already been monitoring a number of nest locations across um, multiple sites in central Scotland, one of which being Falls of Clyde with trail cameras. And she was kind enough to let me use the data she had so far and join her in collecting more to monitor nests as part of the project. Uh, and we carefully organised the data collection between us um, so that we were gathering it all successfully. And this gave me 10 nest locations with consistent data from August 2019, with the original plan to complete full year of monitoring until the end of July 2020. However, this was cut short due to COVID restrictions, and the project now includes data until the end of March this year. As trail cameras are motion censored, uh, the data collection method allows us to uninvasively monitor when badgers were using each nest location and what they were using them for. And from the pilot footage that I'd we'd gathered and looked at through Leslie's footage, I created an ethogram of six behavior types that occurred and recorded their frequency within the nests. Um, and these behaviors were as follows, and I'll have a couple of videos here. So first up was a grooming behavior, as, as Claire had already said, and this was um, as, as, as Claire had shown as well. So this is one badger um, grooming in the nest. And if we just click a video should play. And so that's that char characteristic biting of the fur and scratching of the belly. Uh, again, sitting in the, the donut nest there, you can see. Uh, so next behavior up was resting, and this was a single badger. Again, sleeping in the nest or pausing in the nest for a, a duration of time. Um, so again, I should just take another video. You can see a, an adger, a, a, a badger curled up in the nest there. Um, and as you can see, it's at, at one in the morning. So it's a, a badger equivalent of a lunchtime nap. And the next behavior I classified as social. Um, so this was two or more badgers using the nest. And this could be any of displaying any of the other behaviors um, that I'd, I'd included 
um, but as part of their group. Uh, but it wasn't limited to them, so it also included um, play fighting or, or other behaviours such as that. So um, if you play, we should, you can see two badgers in there, again, grooming away at each other um, before one lies down to have a wee sleep. So that um, video there was nest maintenance. Um, so that was my next behaviour. Um, and as you can see, the badger comes over and gathers some bedding. It was gathering bedding out the nest before, and it's gathering some more the same way we could see in Claire's videos to pull into a nest this time um, rather than into a set. Next up is mating behaviours. Um, so it's two badgers uh, mating or mating behaviours related to it, such as biting the back of the neck or, or rutting. And the last behaviour was territorial. And that was, that um, again, some behaviours that we'd seen in Claire's videos, but focused on nests. So that was scent marking in a nest um, or, or, or in one instance, creating a latrine in one as well. So again, there'll be one last video there. I'll just quickly scent marks before running off. I also included a, a number of, a, a subset of times in which badgers were not in the nests to be used in the data. Um, and I recorded these as absent using a number of false triggers. And this was when the camera sensors were picked, um, set off by other, um, other triggers such as weather, rodents, birds, but I never um, included anything that would have also prevented a badger from using the nest, such as people or dogs. And the 10 nest locations we monitored over the eight months provided me with a huge data set to work with, um, which you can see I managed here in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And it also involved going through more than 24,000 video clips over the eight month period, um, which is one thing the spare time in, in the first lockdown did help me get through the videos. Um, so just the next slide, please. So next up was the nest mapping, and, and this involved extensive survey work of the sites um, involved in the project to map new nest locations where we found where we could find them, um, set locations, latrines, and these were all recorded by hand in the field following the Scottish Badger survey guidance. And where possible, this involved walking line transects um, in a, a group um, across the to record all features and across the reserve. And you can see in the, the bottom picture there, just about um, myself, Lindsay, and Claire, and, and some of the volunteers we had, um, and almost a line working our way through the woodland to record features. And again, this was all gathered together and managed in a Microsoft Excel file. And from there, I was able to create detailed um, geo-referenced maps in QGIS, which contained all these locations of features. Um, and the first stage in creating these was, was to create a base map to work from. 
uh, again in QGIS, and you, you can see that there for Falls of Clyde. Um, so to do this, I started with um, mapping the boundary of the reserve, adding a buffer that we wanted to extend our survey into to make sure we caught those important habitat edges. And then as well, um, shading out any area we weren't going to investigate as part of the project. We also checked our records against records held by Scottish badgers um, and, uh, and then included habitat details using an open source um, resource called the Habitat Map of Scotland um, from Scottish Natural Heritage. So just the next slide there, please. Thank you. So you can see in the figure here how I mapped the, the different uh, features. So this is a, a zoom close of the reserve map um, with the base, base layer taken off. And I replaced the, the complex, um, and you can see the features mapped individually, uh, so I could identify them uh, in between the contour lines. And I replaced the um, complex habitat map of Scotland with semi simple linear features because I was interested primarily in the habitat edge. And this made the information much easier to work with uh, and analyse, but it also um, made it easier to process because the habitat map of Scotland is a a huge resource, which would have took a lot of more processing power to, to run through my analysis. Once all the footage was viewed and the records were mapped, it was time to analyze the data. And the first step of this was to use post hoc um, proximity analysis between QGIS and the RStudio. And this was to determine the, the, the distance um, measurements um, to be used within all the models that I was going to run. R Studio was then used to create generalized linear models to analyze my data, and these included fixed and random effects where appropriate, and uh, used model selection using likelihood ratio tests. The selected model was then checked through its distribution, and that made sure we were using the right model for the data we had to make sure our analysis was accurate. And the next, step, thank you. As part of um, planning the methodology, I also had to consider the ethics uh, of what we were doing and any licensing requirements there were um, to, whilst in our planning stages. And a, a license obtained uh, from Scottish Natural Heritage, which is now Nature Scott, is required for research or scientific work in instances where the research could result in an offence relating to the badgers from happening. For example, work involving marking badgers or, or tagging badgers to, to track them. But the survey methods we used, as I said, was were uninvasive. So they didn't require a license provided we carried them out sensibly, correctly, and made sure we didn't risk harming any badgers or any set locations we were looking at. So all, and to ensure this was done, all the research was planned to be non-invasive and in line with best practice guidelines. And I worked closely with Scottish Badger Charity and the other organisations, including um, Scottish Wildlife Trust, and made sure they were happy with any changes to the methodology that were needed as we went on. And of course, the project was ongoing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, to minimise the risk to public health, all Scottish government and university guidelines were strictly adhered to in relation to when and if all aspects of the research, particularly fieldwork, could be undertaken safely. So just the uh, next um, slide, thank you. And we're just going to look at the results of the project now. So my first model was, um, as you might hopefully remember, was to investigate where above ground nests were located in relation to the other features that we'd identified throughout the Badger territory. And these were sets, um, habitat and territory boundaries, so latrines and habitat edge. And the model found that nest locations occurred significantly closer to habitat edges than to latrines and all set types. The box plot here shows this with dis sorry, distance from the nearest nest on the y-axis and each of the features examined on the x-axis along the bottom. Each dot surrounding the box plots represents the distance that a nest occurred from that feature. Um, so when you look at that, it's also worth noting that individual nests did occur closely to all the features. It was just that habitat edges was a lot more significant. Uh, just the next slide, thank you. My second model was to investigate research question two, which was when the badgers use nests 
in terms of time of day and time of year. And this model found that the probability of a badger using a nest here again on the y-axis um, uh, from the bottom to the top was significantly higher during the hours of darkness with the probability increasing after dusk and decreasing down towards dawn as can be seen through the times along the bottom there making a u shape of a uh, uh, of use and this u shape curve reflects the data for all eight months of the project but the general shape was the same when it was broken down into looking at individual months and with slight vari variation occurring um, in use around changing dusk and dawn times. So what this model shows is that badgers were using nest almost exclusively at night, bar a, bar a few instances, but also used and maintained them fairly consistently throughout the winter months. And just on to the next one. Thank you, perfect. And our final model combined the locations of the 10 monitor nests and the frequency of the behaviours displayed and that was to investigate research question three, which was, are the locations of nests related to their primary function within a territory? So first off, in the left graph here, the frequency of territorial behaviours um, observed in the nest, again, seen on the x-axis, um, sorry, seen on the y-axis um, up to on the left, significantly decreased as a distance from habitat edge, seen on the x-axis along the bottom, increased. So these behaviours were less the further the nest occurred away from a habitat edge, and that was a significant pattern. Similarly, in the second graph, the frequency of mating behaviours observed in nests also significantly decreased, but this time as the distance, the, nest, the distance that nests occurred from main sets increased, with distance here again on the x-axis along the bottom. So what conclusions could we draw when we, we broke down the significant results that we found? Well, firstly, I would say that the results confirm that there's a general gap in knowledge in terms of badger nests. The project suggests that they are one more common than previously considered eh, due to the number we found. Two, they function as more than diurnal resting places because of the variety of behaviors we've seen in them. And three, they're definitely not day nests because of the frequency we've seen them being used at night. The results of the study also suggest that different nets may perform different roles, and Ernest Neal was right in attempting to classify these. In fact, the significant association between key life stages, such as mating and proximity to main sets, supports his classification of a set nest. But the results that we uh, gathered through the research suggest that there's nests with functions that Neil um, or literature hadn't previously considered. The significant relationship between territorial displays and habitat boundaries, but not latrines, suggests that nests may also have a territorial function, similar to but separate from latrine marking. And lastly, nests are a resource which badgers return to and maintain even during the winter months. And as Claire said, this is a time when they're traditionally considered to spend more time underground um, and less time out and about foraging throughout their territory. And if these net results suggest nests also facilitate or support sets in um, supporting key life stages and behaviours, then they may deserve more attention and legislation, guidance and practice going forward. And what um, Falls of Clyde showed us specifically is that with all the great habitat around, even in prime um, prime foraging and prime set habitat, badgers still use nests when they have other features available to them, meaning that there's nests that are not used through necessity, but are a feature that fits in in their territory and their ecology. Okay, so just the next slide, thank you. So what's the outcomes of the project and, and what's what, what next steps could there be? Well, as said here, the survey provides a novel insight into the use of above ground nests um, and as such it gives us a greater understanding of, of key biological and information ecological information relating to badgers and this information could be used to ensure that current badger legislation mitigation best practice guidelines are fit for purpose and also just help us understand more how how badgers live their lives 
in terms of next steps, I feel that greater consideration and awareness of nests is required, but there's also definitely more to learn with regards to their function, their use, and their importance. This project really laid groundwork for a um, greater spatial or temporal study and to fully understand this and, and look more. Increasing, for example, um, increasing the length of the study could help us greater understand their use over time and the effects of changing environmental variables with uh, stronger or, or, or colder winters. Um, whereas a spatial increase could help us understand site-specific variables more as well as investigating how use might alter in different badger densities in different parts of the country. And then thinking on a smaller scale, investigating how nests are used by individual badgers and they're used by cubs in late spring or autumn, which is a time that I didn't get a chance to monitor, would give a, a great insight into the role of nesting group dynamics. But even then, we're just scratching the surface. Um, I'm sure there's, there's, with many things with badgers, I'm sure there's so much more to learn. And just next slide, thank you. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge a few individuals and um, groups because there was a number of individuals and organisations involved in the project and it wouldn't have been possible to achieve the results that I did without everyone's help. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, my supervisor, Dr Stuart White, and everyone else that offered me advice and guidance at the University of Glasgow Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine. I would like to thank Scottish Wildlife Trust, in particular Claire and Lindsay, for all their survey assistance throughout the project as well as David from the RSPB. Of course, Elaine and Leslie for bringing me into the project um, and looking at um, above ground nests and all the Scottish Badgers volunteers who came along to help. And lastly, I'd like to thank my employer, Lorraine, at Cairn Ecology for supporting me throughout all my studies. Finally, um, I was uh, gladly able to show you some badgers, videos of badgers using nests and what I was looking for um, as part of the project. But for anyone who would like to see more, they should check out Leslie's YouTube channel, which has loads of uh, amazing nest videos by searching badger day nests on YouTube. And as you can imagine, the benefit of trawling through hours and hours of footage of mice or the sun triggering cameras, you get the occasional video of a badger just acting like a badger. Um, I should be able to play that one. Thank you all for listening, anyone. Is there any questions? Thanks, Michael. You know, it really was great to be part of that study. And when you start looking, it's amazing how many the nests you actually found. Um, and I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great to have these nests protected under the same laws as sets and things? So, um, so yeah, and well, there's a couple of questions came in. But just before we go to them, can I be sneaky and ask a wee quick question? Of course. Um, is there anything that we can do as individuals, not as part of Scottish Wildlife Trust, but as just individuals or volunteers? Um, what what can we do if we see nests? What who do we report that to? Um, so there's uh, it's a great question. I think the, the most important thing to do with nests just now is um, try and record them as you go, the same way you might record a, a set, just so that we can hopefully. And in, in, in the future, and as things go on, build up a better understanding of them and, and build up a better record of, of where they might be and, and um, uh, widen that knowledge base. So just record them and look out for them and, and, and try and identify them yourself and, and you might learn more as you go as well. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, so let me go to the question and answers. So... The first one is, are there any differences between male and female badgers? Yeah, another great question. Um, male badgers are a lot bigger than female badgers. Um, they're sexually dimorphic, so um, male badgers are larger. Um, and you can 
so badges are uh, identifying individual badges and cameras is a lot to do by looking at the the shape of the markings on their face or, or their ears um, the length of their tail or um, specific markings so you might have a badger that has a, a bit of a limp or a, a torn ear um, but you can often recognize male badgers by their size but also they sometimes look like they've got two tennis balls in their mouth so they've got a, a bigger chunkier face yeah, I've seen that a few times. It's quite good, isn't it? You can really tell them apart. Yeah. Um, let me see. Ali's asked, apart from human interference or flooding, do badgers tend to reuse the same set over generations or years? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so even after flooding, uh, badgers can return to sets, but some, um, they, they definitely do use them generation, generationally and they're... Um, very committed to their set locations. So some well-researched sets down in England eh, are known to be hundreds of years old and they've been occupied by generation after generation of our badger group. So another reason why it's really important to protect set locations and, and make sure they're looked after because the badgers depend on them generation after generation. What laws are badgers protected under? So badgers are protected under the Protection of Badgers Act. And that protects um, both badgers and their sets from disturbance or interference. Um, so an interference can be anything from intentionally um, damaging the set or, or trying to block it up, um, but also uh, working too closely or, or, um, too, or, or being too loud around the set. So, but a lot of it's to be, be doing with being intentional. Um, the best thing to do if you see a, a set is just to be respectful around it and... Um, Keep your distance, be quiet, just so you're not disturbing anything. Um, but there's loads of information, I'm sure, through Scottish Wildlife Trust and definitely through Scottish Badgers about the different protection in place and ways you can help with that as well. Thank you. And um, we've got a couple of minutes left. So there's one more question. If you've got time to stick a question in anybody, if you want to put the last one in. But um, the one I've got from Sarah is, is there a hierarchy in a badger clan? She thinks yes. And is grooming associated with that? Um, and there's a few tags on, have you studied it? Um, and do they have different roles? Lots of questions. So first of all, is it a hierarchy? <laughs> yeah, it's a, another great question. Um, so there is a hierarchy in, in badger clans. Um, they live in fairly loose social groups, but there's often a dominant male uh, called a boar and a dominant female called a sow. Um, and, and the although mating does occur with other females, these tend to be the, the two mating individuals in the group. Uh, insubordinate males will often be pushed out, but these can also drift in and out of a, a territory. Um, in terms of grooming, allo grooming, uh, as you've seen in Claire's videos and, and briefly in, in mine, does occur within a, a, a set, and, and this can be females grooming the dominant male. Um, but females will also groom their cubs and their yearlings um, I haven't personally studied that but I know there is research into the some of the social dynamics of badgers um, and that role that those roles could be motherly and it could be um, to, to show respect to the dominant the dominant male as well um, or also part of that uh, mating or breeding behaviour too uh, to, to build up to that but yeah great question yeah it's a good one um well, I think that's it, actually, unless anybody has any other questions. Whatever, hold your peace. Oh, here's one came in. I knew it was going to come. Um, okay, for Michael's studies and for the Falls of Clyde, Will's asked, do you ever supplementary, supplementally feed badgers, um, say for trail camera footage? Um, and I see you can buy badger food in pet shops. Is this a good thing? It's another great question. Um, thanks, Will. Um, for my study, we didn't be any uh, of the nest locations or anything else because we wanted to record instances in which badgers were using the nest naturally. We didn't want to influence that in any way so that we could record how they used them without any human interference. Um, I don't know if Claire wants to say a wee bit about um, Falls of Clyde badgers or... Yeah, I'll 
Yes, yeah, so um, we don't feed our badgers either. There's plenty of food in the natural environment for them. Um, we don't want to habituate them to us. We don't want them to rely on us for food. We want them to eat the natural food that is the best food for them. Um, so we don't uh, bait our trail cameras either. Um, we just put them in locations where they are likely to go. So we would look for things like pathways maybe or... Um, like looking onto the set but not right at the set so we don't cause any disturbance um you know animals have evolved to eat certain foods and they are the best foods for them so i i wouldn't feed wild animals in that way yeah it's a really good point um okay everybody well if no one's got any more to say i think i'll just wrap up by saying thank you so much it's been truly fascinating it's been a great evening actually um, and I hope you back home will be inspired to, to maybe come on a Falls of Clyde Badger watch when they start up again, maybe when people can sit a little bit closer together. So it should be soon. And um, remember, we have a Badger watch tomorrow, a kind of virtual Badger watch that you can book onto. Um, and it's in partnership with Edinburgh Zoo. So although it's a wild set within the ground, so it's really interesting. Um, and it's quite new for us. We want to see what's going to happen with our, uh, our cameraman on the ground there and being back to us. So um, tune in for that tomorrow night. And um, I think that's us. Um, I'll, you can unmute yourself, everybody, and say um, goodbye. And thank you to the panellists. And thank you to Rory too, the man behind the, um, the technical stuff there. Thank you everyone for coming and listening and watching the Badger footage and hopefully it's given you a little idea of what they get up to and um, just encourage you to go and find out more about Badgers. Yep, thank you everyone. Bye guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.